Um, we started out talking about the forces leading to the Reformation. Last week we started, uh, we talked about the beginning of the Reformation, particularly with Martin Luther. Now, um, Luther really did launch the Protestant Reformation in 1517 when he nailed those 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral. However, um, he was not the only reformer. And in fact, there were other acts or other processes of reformation that were starting at the same time as Luther. And today we're going to talk about one of those. Um, we're going to talk about other reformers today, especially Ulrich Zwingli, who was Swiss, who actually began to develop some of the same ideas as Luther at the same time as Luther. He was only two months younger than Martin Luther, so he was an exact contemporary working uh, in, in Zurich in Switzerland, well, a couple places, mostly in Zurich. Then we want to talk about the, I'm actually going to move this around a little bit, then I want to talk about John Calvin, who was the French theologian in Geneva, Switzerland. Now, um, John Calvin was the second generation of reformers. He was not the same age, he was not the same time period as Luther and Zwingli, who were first generation. And yet those three men are called the three men of the Reformation. Because Luther's uh, Reformation in Germany, uh, Zwingli's Reformation in Zurich, Switzerland, and then Calvin is significant, even though he was a generation later, because he really was the theologian of the Reformation. He was the one who came together, and we'll talk about that, and created a systematic uh, understanding of what Protestant theology was all about. Prior to that, it had been mostly either uh, partial or polemical. They'd been reacting against things. Calvin comes along and creates the systematic declaration of what we as Protestants believe, uh, particularly. Then we're going to talk about um, uh, the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists were a movement that didn't feel like the Reformers had gone far enough, so they went further. Uh, much to their detriment uh, in many cases. And then finally, I've got Knox up there. I actually want to talk more about the Reformation in Great Britain. If you're an Anglophile, then you should really enjoy this today, because I'm going to be talking about kings and queens and princesses and you know beheadings and all kinds of fun stuff. So uh, we'll get into King Henry and all of that in a, in a few minutes. Next week, we will talk about, beyond that, the growth of Protestantism in several, several places in several ways. Then we'll sort of flip the, the blanket over and talk about the other side of it. That is Catholicism and the Counter-Reformation. It took the Catholic Church a long time to figure out that this Protestant Reformation thing was not going to go away quick, because they assumed, well, it's heresy, we've dealt with heresy before, it'll be gone soon. Well, it didn't, and it wasn't, and so there was a Catholic Counter-Reformation focused on the Council of Trent. Talk about that. Week six, we're going to look at orthodoxy, rationalism, and pietism, and I'll explain what all that means with regard to church history, and then we'll look beyond Christendom. Christendom was when basically all of the civil, Western civilized world was part of the Christian church, and they were all unified in terms of a, basically unified in their fundamental beliefs. Beyond Christendom means we reached a point at which those beliefs were not uni unified. That there were very different beliefs in very different places. That the part that led us to the place now where we have over 1,200 different manifestations of Christianity. There's not one Christendom anymore. There's a lot of different uh, uh, beliefs. They call themselves Christian. And then the last week, week eight, we're going to talk about materialism and its effect in modern times, where the church is now. And then we'll have a final exam. Happened to the exam. <laughs> I don't know. Weird things are happening today. Uh, it's, it's there. Okay, well, it's just not on the screen, I guess. Um, the final exam. And I will give you about three quarters of the way through all of the material you need to know for studying the final exam. I will also tell you that we're probably fine this week, next week under the growth of Protestantism, and then Catholicism and Counter Reformation. But when we get to six week, is week six and after, where we have this massive dividing of different Christian churches, splitting, and, you know, it gets really complicated to try to cover all that in five hours of lecture. And so the last few weeks, I'm going to have to be summarizing a lot, and there's going to be some content that we simply won't have time for, because it just gets way complicated and the, the closer we get to today. Uh, bless you. I mean, just think about how many different manifestations of the Christian church we have, you know, here in Ahi Several Catholic churches that uh, I understand may have some differences in terms of how they interpret Catholic doctrine, from what I've been told. We have charismatics. We have 
Baptists, we have a couple of different Anglican churches. We've got, you know, Presbyterian Church, which includes Baptists and Methodists and all kinds of stuff. So, yeah, it gets very complicated the closer you get to modern times. And so we'll do the best we can with that, though. Any questions about where we're going? Do make sure that you check the, the sign-in sheet and that you check this week. If you actually were here previous weeks, do check the box for that, okay? But not just because you watched the video. All right, let's talk about... No, I don't know what's... Okay, we're back. Um, I want us to talk about these four people, especially we're going to talk about Ulrich Stingley in detail and John Calvin. The guy in the upper left and upper right. John Calvin was kind of dark, but in this picture. Uh, John Knox in the lower left, as I said, I'm going to talk more about the overall um, Reformation in England, or Great Britain, actually, because it includes Scotland. In Great Britain, John Knox was taught by John Calvin and took Calvinism, or the Calvin Doctrine, you know, Reform Doctrine, back to Scotland and was the father of the Presbyterian churches and really was a major leader in the whole Protestant movement in Great Britain. We'll talk about him and others. And then on the bottom right, Menno Simons. I'm not going to talk about Menno Simons a lot specifically, but uh, the Anabaptist movement, which began in Zurich, actually, during the time of Spengli. Um, eventually, most of the Anabaptists were gone. The largest contingent uh, then and today, in terms of descendants of the Anabaptist movement, are the Mennonites. The Mennonite, you have all heard Mennonites, right? The Mennonites get their name from Menno Simons. He was the, uh, he wasn't the first of the Anabaptists, but he's the one that really ended up, he had been a Dutch priest and he ended up taking over leadership of a particular group of the Anabaptists who became known as Mennonites. And uh, most other factions of the Anabaptists uh, died out, literally, because of persecution. There were more Anabaptists killed during the time of persecution um, in the Reformation than all Christians that were martyred in the first three centuries before Constantine. That's why there are a lot of Anabaptists left. They don't use that name anymore anyway. But they were, perse they were persecuted by Catholics, by all other Protestant groups, by civic authorities, everybody, and they mostly were being executed. And so we had more Anabaptist martyrs than all total Christian martyrs during the time of the Roman Empire up until Constantine. Pretty serious stuff. What does Anabaptist mean? It means rebaptizer. I'll talk about that. Okay? Let's talk about, first, Ulrich Stingley. And I'm just going to put all this up here and then kind of walk through it. I didn't even realize I had these as separate things. Okay. Um, Ulrich Zwingli. Ulrich Zwingli, uh, born in a small Swiss village in 1484. Um, he grew up in Switzerland. As I said before, he was two months younger than Martin Luther, so exact contemporaries. Um, he grew up, Zwingli grew up as a very academically oriented young man. He studied in the universities of Basel and Bern. He then went on to the University of Vienna and then later came back to Basel. In 1506, received a Master of Arts degree, and this was a time in which humanism, that is the, the, a real appreciation for, for logic and human thinking and human endeavor and the arts and all of that kind of stuff, was the major sort of philosophical and academic theme in Western Europe. And so he grew up underneath all, under all of that. He um, became quite proficient in Latin, very proficient in Greek. He was such a student of Greek, for instance, that Erasmus, the great scholar who translated the, um, it came out with a new Greek New Testament. Zwingli was so enamored of that that he had a copy made of it for himself, small enough that he could carry it around with him and you know read it all the time. Now, you think, well, so what? He was a scholar. He ended up becoming a priest, and this was a time in Western Europe when many priests could barely read. There had there had been uh, we've talked in this class about the, the period of time in which the monasteries became kind of party houses. It's almost like they were, they were fraternity houses. There was not an emphasis on learning. People were being given positions in the church because they either bought them or because somebody liked them, not because they were particularly pious or ready for it. Um, there was, at this time, there were a great many priests that they recognized that never bothered to write, read the New Testament, and yet they were priests. Along comes somebody like Ulrich Singley, 
who has, who has uh, aggressively studied philosophy and literature. He speaks and reads Latin and Greek. He is a, a scholar. He's not only a scholar, and then as a priest, is recognized as a pastor, um, but he also ends up being a patriot. Switzerland at this time, I, I need to explain to you, was not one country. There was a confederation of what were called cantons. These cantons were like states, you know, like the U.S. has states, Mexico has states, except each of those states was officially independent. They had their own, many of them had their own uh, currency, they had their own political, you know, affairs of state, they did their own um, various kinds of political relationships and treaties with other countries. They saw themselves as being Swiss, but second to being independent. There were, in Ulrich Stingley's time, 13 of these cantons, each of them independent. And as the Protestant Reformation developed, part of these cantons, uh, these states of Switzerland, went in the direction of a state with Catholicism. Part of them went toward Protestantism. And it meant that even within the cantons of Switzerland, there was a huge conflict over this. Okay? Now, I said that Zwingli was not only a, a, a scholar and a pastor, he was also a patriot. One of the things, you wouldn't have thought this about the Swiss, but do you all know about in, in the Vatican right now, the official bodyguards of the Pope are the Swiss Guard. They still wear those funny uniforms. That, goes, that harkens back to a time when Switzerland was famous for uh, military. They were the mercenaries that got hired by armies all over Europe. If you needed, you know, if you're going to battle against somebody and you didn't have enough of your own soldiers, you hired Swiss people to come in, and they would serve as mercenaries. Well, Spainley, um, in 1512, and again in 1515, when he's serving as a priest, the various, from the, the canton uh, where Zurich was located, uh, various mercenaries from his area went to fight in an Italian campaign, and he went with them as their pastor. And so he was involved in two campaigns over a four-year period. The first one, the side that the Swiss mercenaries were fighting on won, and so Zwingli saw how terrible they were in acting. They looted, they pillaged, they did horrible things to the people they conquered in the first campaign. In the second campaign, three and a half years later, um, the opposite happened. His side lost, and he saw how much uh, how oppressed they were. The whole thing led him to, uh, to reject the idea of military service for money. He, and this was a huge income for, for the Swiss cantons at that time. Uh, one of the major sources of income they had was renting their soldiers out. And so Zwingli comes back from these two events and he decides that the Swiss had been, as he said, selling blood for gold. And so he began to develop a very strong sense that this was wrong. Not com now, Zwingli was not a complete pacifist. In fact, he died in battle, as you'll hear in a minute. But he did believe that the idea of fighting a war for money was wrong. And so he fought against it later on. And that was one of the things that led him to come into opposition with the Roman uh, church, with, with the Pope. Okay. Now, after, after he was, a, was appointed a priest in the town of Glarus, not a major town. But after 10 years there, he was sent to become the priest of an abbey, you know, a monastery. Well, this monastery was famous for um, pilgrimages. People would go on pilgrimages there, and when they made these pilgrimages, he, he started realizing people thought that their salvation would be assured if they went on a pilgrimage. Well, being a scholar of the original, you know, of, of languages and also of scripture, he, Zwingli goes in and he starts studying scripture and he realizes there is nothing in the Bible that would suggest that going on a pilgrimage to some site, the abbey where he was the priest, for instance, is in any way going to affect your salvation. And so as he studied the Bible and started paying attention to what was going on in the Catholic Church, he started having serious questions about some of this stuff. Um, and his focus was on the Bible. Then in 1518, uh, very significantly, he was transferred, and I say transferred because, of course, priests got moved wherever the church told them to go. He got transferred to the Grossmünster of Zurich. Zurich was a major city then, as it is now. The Grossmünster literally means the big church. So he became the priest of the large church in Zurich. Um, while he was there, as he studied scripture, as he preached, 
um, he began to think through whether or not the church was getting it right. And he started coming to the same conclusions that he later realized Martin Luther was coming to around the same period of time. 1518 was when he got transferred to Grossminster. 1517 was when Luther nailed the 95, one year earlier, nailed the 95 Theses on the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral. And then it was after that that Luther was really developing. So Luther and Spangli simultaneously, one in Germany, one in, in Switzerland, are coming up with many of the same conclusions about what's wrong with the church and the fact that it is not biblical. Oh, um, yes. Were, were, they, were they communicating? Not at, this, not at this point. Later on they did. But uh, when Zwingli got exposed, because Luther you know, ended up printing a lot of stuff and distributing it, when Zwingli first started reading Luther's conclusions, he realized he's, he's come to the same things I am. And then after, uh, fairly early on, they did start communicating, because Luther developed a reputation fairly early. But, but by 1518, when uh, Zwingli went to the Grossmünster in Zurich and started developing these ideas of his, that was before we heard about Luther. So that's why you know we say Luther started the Reformation. It's true in terms of a movement that ended up where it was. But there were other people. You have to remember too that that um, Wycliffe and uh, in Britain and Huss in Bohemia both had developed a lot of these same ideas earlier, and they got suppressed. Okay, so. Bingley is studying scripture, he is applying to it the academic rigors and logic that he had learned as a humanist scholar, and he began to develop what can only be called righteous outrage about the way the church was being run, particularly against what he finally decided was pure superstition that was being passed off as Christianity, like, oh, my salvation will be assured if I do this pilgrimage, for instance. Um, he, he declared that superstition. He saw that many of the people were being exploited by the church, and particularly he saw the mercenary services that, because in a number of cases, the reason why the mercenaries went, went to war is because the Pope said they should. And so that all became part of his, his direction. Well, in, in Zurich, um, at the Grossmünster, Zwingli's preaching apparently was excellent. Um, he lived a life of real devotion, a man of learning, and he very quickly became a big hero of the people of Zurich. They really liked him. They thought this guy's got it right. That was sort of sealed when in 1519 the Black Death, the plague, hit Zurich. One fourth of the population of the city died. Zwingli stuck right in there taking care of the people who were a part of his parish and, and looking after them. He himself was infected with the Black Death and almost died. He very nearly died, but he did survive. Because of the way he acted in caring for his congregation um, during that time, he really was elevated even, be, even beyond what he had been before um, by the people in the, by the, in the eyes of the people of Zurich. Okay. Right after that, um, we have an instance where you remember one of the big things that set Luther off was the fact that the, they were selling indulgences to raise money to build St. Peter's Basilica. And the Pope had made arrangements with uh, various political leaders, uh, particularly German, to uh, sell these indulgences and split the money. Well, right after the whole plague thing, a representative of the Pope, um, a, a, a Dominican, shows up at Zurich with the assignment to sell indulgences in Zurich. And Zwingli says, I don't think so. And the government, the city council of Zurich, because they were independent, and Zurich was kind of a city state at that point, they backed him and they, they said, uh, uh, on your way, you know, seller of indulgences, you, you're not to stay here. Um, and so that was an example of the fact, one of the first times in which the whole city government backed Zwingli's play against the Catholic Church, because that, that Dominican was there under the authority of, of the Vatican to sell these indulgences. Okay, right after this, Francis I of France. You will remember from our other conversations that Francis I was king of France during this time period. Charles V, who had been uh, Charles of Spain, had become Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. Well, they were always fighting each other and you know back and forth and they had armies and everything else. Well, during this particular period of time, Francis I of France had the Pope on his side. At other times, the Pope was on Charles V's side in that conflict. So 
Francis I decides he needs to put together a bigger army to fight against Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, and so he contacts the Swiss Confederation, as it was called. It wasn't one nation, but they were confederated, and says, send me soldiers. And every canton sends soldiers to this army, a uh, French army, to fight the Holy Roman Emperor, except one. Guess which one that was? Zurich. 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 Okay. Zwingli said, no, this is wrong. And the, city, and the, the city-state of Zurich said, you're right, we're not going to do this anymore. At that point, the Pope steps in and says, Francis is fighting this battle with my approval, and therefore you have to send troops to support him, or I'll take action against you as the Pope. Well, the, the city decides they have to do what the Pope says, so they send the soldiers. But at that point, Zwingli becomes vividly aware of the fact that the Pope is using secular power and influence to get what he wants that has nothing to do with the spiritual realm. That was the start of his strong sense that the Pope was abusing his authority in the wrong way. And the, the cracks started forming in terms of uh, uh, Zwingli's relationship with the Catholic Church. Even though he's now a Catholic, he's still a Catholic priest at this point. He started more and more at that point to attack superstition, to attack what he saw as an unjust use of power by the Pope. And during all of the same time, Luther was creating a stir in Germany. And this was right about the time when, when Zwingli is deciding the Pope is, is wrong and probably shouldn't be obeyed, is when Luther not only has refused to listen to the Pope, but is, at the Diet of Worms tells the, the Emperor, Charles V, I'm not going to do what you tell me because I have to obey my conscience. So all of this is happening at the same time. Um, Zwingli, about that time, becomes a, more aware of Luther's teaching, and he writes that even before he had read Luther's teaching and became aware of it following the Diet of Worms, he had reached a lot of the same conclusions, and they were very much on the same page. <coughs> and at that point, in 1522, the same year as the Diet of Worms, Zwingli determines that he is going to undertake a campaign of complete reformation of the church in Zurich. And the government of Zurich, the city council of Zurich, agrees to support it in reforming the church. So he starts moving forward. Um, at that time, he was under the ecclesiastical authority of the Bishop of Constance. Well, he's preaching all this stuff that is against the Catholic Church already, even though he's still a priest. The bishop hears about all this, and he decides i got to deal with this guy. And so he comes to the city council, who were the legal authorities, and say, you got to stop him from preaching. And they go, well, no, wait a minute. We're not sure if you're right or he's right. So let's have a, a gathering where you can argue it out. Well, while this is going on in 1522, during the Lenten season, now, it was actually against the law to violate Lent, which meant you weren't allowed to eat meat during Lent. You had to... You know, there were periods of fasting. All of this was strictly controlled and legal. Well, one of the things that Zwingli started preaching against was the regulation, the requirement that you fast, that you legally had to fast, because he felt that was a spiritual discipline and you should have the choice. So, in 1522, during Lent, Zwingli and some of his followers get together and they take two smoked sausages and slice them up and share them amongst everybody. Well, the sausage hit the fan at that point. <laughs> this is known as the affair of the sausages. Because he had openly violated the regulation for obligatory fasting. And so they decide, we got to move forward on this. Um, the, the, the bishop says, you've got to stop. The city council says, we're not sure if he's wrong or right, so we're going to have to talk this out. At the same time, secretly, Zwingli, who is still a priest, marries. He marries a widow. Um, ends up eventually having four children. It's, it's done secretly, but at the same time, he starts openly preaching that celibacy is wrong, that the church does not have a right to call people to be celibate. Actually, in the New Testament, there's one place where Paul writes that there will come a time when people will forbid marriage, and it's talking about that being wrong. I don't know how they've ever dealt with that. But anyway, um, so he starts, he starts preaching this, he and ten other priests write to the Pope and say, we think you should let us get married. The Pope says, absolutely not. Still, Zwingli has gone ahead and married a widow named Anna Reinhardt, and she continued to be his faithful wife, whom he loved dearly, and about whom he wrote 
very precious things after her death. She, she died before he did. Well, the Pope at that point, Adrian I, um, seemed to recognize, well, he acknowledged openly that the church needed to be reformed, but he didn't like the way Zwingli was going about it. He thought it was too radical. So they agree that they're going to get together, Zwingli, with either the Bishop of Constance or a representative of the Bishop of Constance, and they're going to debate this stuff. They're going to talk about it. They're going to get everything they need, need out on the table. Well, um, several hundred, like 600 spectators show up for this debate. The, the, the bishop himself doesn't show up, but he sends a representative. And Zwingli has written a long treatise identifying all of his reasons and supported them from Scripture. And he's got, you know, it's very scholarly. Well, he shows up and he presents this document. He presents his side of it. And the bishop's representative refuses to speak. He says, I'm not responsible, to, I don't have to respond to you. We're going to call the council of the church and have you suppressed and probably will burn you at the stake. But we're not going to answer. Well, the city council is watching all this and they're saying, now wait a minute. We agree you're going to get together and talk about this because he says one thing and you say something else and we haven't decided who we're going to listen to, so don't you want to respond? The bishop says, I'm not allowed to talk higher theology in front of mere lay people. <laughs> So he still doesn't answer. And the indication is that the guy just simply knew he wasn't up to it. Zwingli was a better scholar. He knew scripture. He had explanations for why he professed the thing he did. So the city council says, well, no one has refuted Zwingli's preaching. So therefore, as far as we concern, we're concerned, he can keep doing what he's doing. At that moment, there was an official break between Zwingli and the church in Zurich and the church of Rome. The Catholic Church. That was when it happened. When they, the city council, who was the legal authority in Zurich, when they said you got your chance to respond, and the bishop's representative refused to refused to even try to refute Zwingli's arguments. So, from that point on, Zwingli was the recognized leader of the Reformation efforts, which were being supported by the Council of Government in the uh, in the city of Zurich. Now, there was a difference. So they, they proceeded to do all sorts of things. Um, they, um, clergy are allowed to marry, communion is offered in both kinds, which means both bread and wine. We had a, a comment about that in Bible study this morning. A couple, the, a couple of the founders of our church who used to go to a, a Catholic church in, uh, when they lived somewhere else in Mexico because it was the only church there, and they, talk, they mentioned the fact that they only in that church offered the bread to the people. The priest took the bread and the, the cup, but... Uh, the lay people only got the bread. Well, that's communion in one kind, where, where only the priest gets to drink of the cup. Well, the, I, the one of the movements of the Reformation was the priest is, you know, is, is not that much more special than us. Therefore, we all should drink of communion or take of communion in both kinds, the bread and the cup. Um, and so that started happening. Um, icons were removed. The question of infant baptism came up. Zwingli actually ended up defending infant baptism, which is one of the things he disagreed with some of the other reformers about. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention that a little bit when I get to the Anabaptists, because they were the ones that really wanted to push further. Um, it's interesting that Zwingli becomes fairly radical in terms of what he will allow. For instance, Zwingli played seven musical instruments, and apparently was very good at it. And yet, Luther and Zwingli differed in terms of what they thought that the, the true church should be like. Um, and I once had one of my professors describe this as the, the, in a sock drawer analogy. Okay, <laughs> Just assume you've got a drawer full of socks and you haven't worn some of them in a long time or for one reason or another some of them shouldn't be in there. Luther would have opened the sock drawer and he says, okay, that doesn't belong there and that doesn't belong there and that doesn't belong there, but unless I specifically think it shouldn't be, everything else gets to stay. So Luther removed only those things that he thought specifically were against Scripture. Zwingli, on the other hand, would have pulled the sock drawer out, dumped it all out on the bed, put the drawer back, and only selected the things he thought were appropriate to put back. So what that meant was, in terms of church, unless Scripture specifically said something shouldn't be, Luther allowed it. With Zwingli, unless Scripture specifically said it should be, he rejected it. You see the difference? So Luther, Lutheranism, ended up still looking a lot more like Catholicism, Catholic liturgy and worship and things, than the Sphinglian uh, Reformation did. 
because they got rid of icons, they challenged all those things, and, for instance, even though he played seven musical instruments, including, you know, including organ, um, Sphingley said, I don't read anywhere in the New Testament where these particular musical instruments were played in the church, and so therefore we're not going to use them. And they didn't have instrumental music in Zurich. Um, so you sort of get an idea about that. He was very serious about it, and, and he banned anything that he didn't specifically see as being called for in Scripture. Um, he went so far as to say, for instance, that the emphasis should be on the Word of God, read and, and preached, and so therefore he didn't even think communion should be offered too often, because he thought communion could get in the way of hearing the spoken Word, um, that which is... That's why you still have churches. For instance, he recommended four times a year. A Baptist church that I used to go to, they would have communion whenever there was the, a fifth Sunday of the, of the month, which happens four times a year. Okay? That tradition goes back to Zwingli. Whereas you have other traditions, you know, the, the more, like the Lutheran traditions, the, the Anglican traditions, where it's typical to offer communion at every service, you know, every, every Sunday. Um, you have others, like... The Presbyterian Church, you've got some latitude as to how you want to do that. They say that it should be practiced at least once a quarter. In our church, we do it once a month, the first Sunday of every month. But there, but there were differences. But Zwingli's idea was the Word of God read and spoken and preached is the most important part, so nothing can distract. Even communion can't distract from that. I don't know if you've ever noticed. Um, some churches have the pulpit right in the middle. Some churches have the pulpit to one side. You ever notice that? <coughs> you ever realize there's an important theological point being made there? The point is, what is the main reason we're here? The churches, following the Zwingli idea, is that the preached word, the spoken word you know, from the minister is, a, is the main point. They put the pulpit in the middle, the center of attention. The churches that maintain that preaching is only one part of it, but there are other things going on that are important too, put the pulpit on the side. So there's a theological reason for that difference of where the pulpit is. Uh, some, there are some lithographs and things of the church in Zwingli's time, and they had an elevated pulpit right in the middle, and there were people all the way around them. I mean, you couldn't have a more central focus if you wanted. <laughs> and that was consistent with his belief about the nature of the spoken and, and preached word. Okay. Um, at the same time, Zwingli was a huge believer that the church had a responsibility to care for people in need. There was a major emphasis on caring for the poor, on um, reaching out to those who couldn't take care of themselves. There was a, the development of public education, which had not been ex existed. That means free education for any, any children uh, to be brought in. Prior to that, you had to pay to go to school, and if you couldn't afford to pay, then your kids didn't go to school. So there was a major uh, extension of this Christian charity under Spangley as well. He, when you hear things like, okay, he, he banned the music and all that, you think the guy was a hard-nosed, hard-bitten reformer and negative and everything else. Apparently not at all. He was very scholarly and very serious in many ways, but he also had a great sense of humor. He used a lot of puns and jokes in his writing. He would use, use colorful analogies when he preached, and he was an excellent preacher. He was very compassionate, really believed in caring for people in need, providing for children, providing for the widows, uh, giving education. Um, he was widely loved. As I told you, they, they really respected him, and then the way he acted during the, during the plague and caring for his people, even at a risk of his own life, and he almost did die, they really loved him. People really, really supported him as being a really good man, as well as the theologian that was leading them in the direction they felt they should go. So that's important to understand. Okay. Um, during this whole time, when we have changes in the communion and clergy uh, marrying and, you know, they reduced the fasting laws, they didn't require um, processions on Good Friday unless people wanted to do it, etc., 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 this kind of idea began to spread to some of the other cantons in, in the Swiss Confederation. Um, some of them had been sort of playing with the idea of Protestantism up till then, but because of Zwingli, they started buying into it. What that meant was that he ended up being a target from uh, the Catholic cantons. During this period of time, the Catholic cantons took steps to seek an alliance with Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. They'd always, I mean, Switzerland and Germany. You know, German is one of the official languages of Switzerland now, right? 
Um, and there was always a close relationship. Well, Charles, although he's Spanish originally, was the Holy Roman Emperor and was seen as being over, he was over the nation of Germany at that point. So the Catholic cantons developed a, an alliance with Charles V, and in the process, they began to make threatening noises toward the Protestant cantons, particularly Zurich, in Switzerland, in the Swiss Confederation. Well, they started at first with economic measures against each other, the Catholic cantons and the Protestant cantons, but then in 1531, five of the Catholic cantons got together, got their armies together, and in a surprise attack, attacked the city of Zurich. And when I say surprise attack, they had no clue they were coming until they saw the flags coming over the horizon. So at that point, and actually Zwingli had been warning the Protestant cantons, especially the people of Zurich, you better get ready for war. He said, this is coming. Doesn't matter whether we want it or not. And as I say, he was not a, he was not a complete pacifist like some people who came after him. He didn't advocate war, he didn't think it was a good idea, but he believed that you had to be ready for it if it happened. Well, they weren't ready for it, and when the Catholic armies appeared over the horizon, the army of Zurich very quickly went out to try to, to meet them in the Battle of Kappel. And Zurich, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, um, Spengli went along as a soldier. You know, he went out to fight. Well, because of the surprise attack and a larger army and everything else, the Catholic cantons defeated the army of Zurich, and in the process, Zwingli was wounded. The Catholic armies found him wounded, lying under a tree on the battlefield, and they knew who he was. They recognized him. They ordered him to recant of what they thought was his Protestant heresy, and when he refused, they killed him. And they cut his body up and burned the pieces, and... Uh, scattered it in a river, and then celebrated the fact that they had killed the heretic of Zurich. Um, not a very good ending. I mean, he, he, they, they, they murdered him. He was defenseless at that point. Um, despite that conflict, and, and they ended up, the Catholic cantons forced the Protestant cantons to pay the cost of the battle, you know, to pay their expenses for having a surprise attack. Um, but, Along with that exchange, the agreement was made that all the cantons of Switzerland after that, the Swiss, of the Swiss Confederation, they could decide for themselves what religion they wanted, whether they be Protestant or Catholic. Mm -hmm. And the Protestant uh, beliefs that Zwingli had really launched expanded from that point out uh, considerably, not only in Switzerland but elsewhere. Now, oddly enough, today there are no churches that see themselves as being the heirs to Zwinglian theology. You know, you've got Lutheran churches, started with Luther. The Calvinist or Reformed churches started with Calvin. You've got the Mennonite churches started with Menno Simons. There's no church that points to, specifically that points to Zwingli as being their founder or the, their source. Because Zwinglian theology and the theology of Calvin, which came somewhat later, really were so similar, they kind of merged as part of the Reformed faith. And for the most part, they see Calvin as, as the founder of that theology, even though Zwingli was significantly responsible for it. Um, right after his death, in um, the Council of Zurich appointed uh, Heinrich Bullinger as his, who had been a disciple and, heir, and uh, assistant to uh, Zwingli. They appointed him as the new religious head, and uh, Bullinger conti continued in that role for over half a century until 1575. So the whole Zwinglian idea, and he was very much a disciple of Zwingli's theology, he continued with that, okay? Um, in, in fact, John told me earlier that he found out somehow that he was a descendant of a Bullinger that was a Zwingli's associate, that it was Zwingli's contemporary. Well, if it was Heinrich Bullinger, he became the, the complete heir to everything that Zwingli had stood for, okay? Now, one thing I didn't mention in here, um, in 1529, the Marburg Colloquy, and actually we've cut off the bottom of the screen now too. Um, there's no just more. What's that? There's, well, there's no more on here. There should be. Maybe you have to forward it one more. Remember, well, remember how, there it is. Okay, there we go. Um, I want to now talk about Zwingli's theology a little bit, and that's why I haven't referred yet to the Marburg Colloquy, because that's where we get into the, uh, some of the theological differences. <coughs> the, the, one of the ways that you can understand the difference between Luther and Zwingli is that Luther came to his Protestant beliefs out of a tormented soul. He really did. I mean, we talked last week about how he feared for his salvation. 
He worried that he wasn't good enough. He feared that he might commit a sin before he got to confess it again. He'd die and be condemned for that. And so the doctrine of justification, that is the doctrine of salvation, became almost the entirety of Lutheran theology. Everything was, was linked to that. Um, now, Luther was the, was the pioneer. He was the one waving the flag for the Protestant Reformation, and I'm not taking anything away from him. But he did not develop a more complex theology. Whereas Zwingli did not come to his belief out of this passion that Luther had, but rather in a very reasoned way, because he was a scholar. Um, and so, as a humanist who studied scripture, who invested himself in understanding what the Bible had to say, he was much, had a much broader base in terms of his theological understanding than Luther did. And again, I'm not denying Luther his place in history, but um, the same thing is true when we're going to talk about Calvin in a few minutes. Both Luther and, and another way you can understand the difference in personality and sort of the theology is that both Luther and Zwingli and Calvin and pretty much every theologian of the Reformation believed in predestination. The difference was that Luther believed in predestination because he believed and, and recognized that he was powerless before his own sin and that God had to do it because he couldn't. Whereas Zwingli came to the same conclusion, but instead he did it because of a, uh, he thought it was a logical consequence of the nature of God, that God knows everything, determines everything, and therefore it is God who predestines people to salvation. So they came to the same conclusion, but from completely different directions. Luther, because of a confession of his complete inability to deal with his own sin, so God has to. Zwingli, because of a recognition of who and what God was, and therefore God, you know, God would have preordained to salvation. Now, um, the one of the the biggest areas, in fact, the Marburg, uh, the Marburg Colloquy, I want to get to that. The German Landgrave Philip of Hesse, he was a German prince. He was a Protestant. He saw Luther and Luther's theology. He saw Zwingli in Switzerland. He saw various others, for, for instance, uh, Melanchthon, who worked with Luther, Martin Bucer, who ended up being kind of the mentor to John Calvin. Remember, Calvin was younger. Um, all of these guys were saying much the same way thing, but Bucer was in Strasbourg, uh, Zwingli in Zurich, um, Luther and Melanchthon in Wittenberg. Well, the, the Landgrave Philip of Hesse, this prince, called them all together at Marburg and said, you guys need to get together because you, it sounds to me like you're saying pretty much the same thing and you could work together on this and be more, more powerful. Who suggested this? This is Philip of Hesse. He's a prince. He's called Landgrave Philip of Hesse. Landgrave is his, his princely title. So he recommended they get together and deal with this stuff. They all get together. They identify 15 principles that they need to talk about. They agreed on 14 of them. The one that hung them up was the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Luther insisted that when, G when Jesus said, this is my body, in fact, the story's told, whether it really happened or not, is that Luther sits there. While they're talking about this, Luther's sitting at the table with his beer stein, pounding it on the table, saying, this is my body. This is my body. So Luther maintained the real, physical presence of Christ in, in the body, in the bread, in communion, the bread and the wine. Um, now, interestingly enough, he didn't believe in transubstantiation. And so Luther, again, I love Luther. I think Luther was playing with words because he came up with the doctrine of consubstantiation which said that the body and blood, uh, the, the bread and wine did not literally change into the body and blood, which is what the Catholic Church says in, in the doctrine of transubstantiation, but rather Luther said the presence of Christ is over, under, around, and through, but is really, literally there, just doesn't really change. Uh, come on, Marty, you know, it, it, it didn't quite wash. Zwingli believed that the communion elements were simply a symbolic representation of the body and blood of Christ. That was the 15th principle that they could not agree on. Later on, Calvin, who with, with Mark Bucer as sort of his mentor, Calvin came to an intermediate agreement where he said the presence of Christ is really present, but not physically, spiritually really present. What later on, and this is the term that I use, um, instead of transubstantiation or consubstantiation, Transsignification, which means the elements are still bread and wine, or bread and 
grape juice, whatever you use. They haven't literally changed. There's not some, some mystical, you know, Jesus doesn't descend on the elements, as the Catholics and as Luther even said, but rather that as we take them in faith, they have all of the significance, all of the spiritual reality of the presence of Christ for us. So Calvin sort of walked the middle line. Uh, but Luther and Zwingli could not agree on that, and therefore the Marburg colloquy ended with them not being able to agree on one stance. Now there still was a lot of stuff that was done later. After Luther's death, Melanchthon, who was his uh, colleague and uh, the theologian, Melanchthon who wrote the Augsburg Confession, which is the primary uh, Lutheran confession, he ended up actually getting together with the Zwinglians and with the Swiss reformers in a much more intimate way. But that was some of the ways in which their theology particularly differed. Um, what else do I want to say about, about Stanley? I mentioned the fact that he, uh, you know, his nature, his personality, uh, that he was loved. Let's see if I had something else I wanted to, to get to. Da, 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 da. Um, yes? Pastor, what, what was the word you used for what how Calvin described? No, Calvin didn't use this. Calvin, I don't don't know if Calvin had a word. Oh. The word I use, and then some modern theologians have used, which I think I think represents what Calvin was saying, is transignification. Oh. Meaning trans, something has changed. Signification means it hasn't actually changed in substance, but it's changed in significance. Okay. That when we take the, the, the bread and the wine, that if we do it in faith, it has all the significance as though... What the Catholics or the Lutherans were saying is that the, the presence of Christ was literally there, okay? And so the issue is our faith brings it the significance of being truly the body and blood of Christ. As often as you shall eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. And when I give communion, I will say, you know, as you eat this, this bread and drink this cup in faith, the in faith part is critical. Um, and that's part of my Calvinist doctrine. Any questions about Zwingli? Where they were coming from? Yes? The five Catholic cantons, what proportion of those became um, Protestant? Protestant? I, I don't know. Probably probably not that much. I mean, at that point, they oh, were Oh, that's so what I wondered if it was a big impact. Well, Spingley had a big impact, but that, that battle, um, they decided following the Battle of Capel that um, those that were Catholic could stay Catholic, those that were Protestant could stay Protestant, and they would not try to force anything on each other. Um, that that didn't that act itself did not or that battle itself did not cause anybody to make a change. Now some of them may have become Protestant later, but I don't really know. Okay, uh, and we're moving toward the place. In fact, we're going to talk about the Anabaptists in a minute. We're moving toward the place where um, religious tolerance actually gets introduced by the Anabaptists along this line, even though they were the most persecuted group of all. Okay, all right. Um, we're going to take a break a little bit early. Uh, it's, I've got about seven minutes till. We're coming back in three minutes after, and I'll get into John Calvin, one of my heroes. We'll want to talk now about John Calvin. And again, I'm going to put all this up here. There's not quite as many points because most of this time we spent Just one five, doing one thing. What's that? Just five? Just <laughs> That's not Calvin. That's the hyper Calvinist oh. game later. Thank you very much. You're okay. welcome. Uh, and I, I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> okay, the most important systematizer of uh, Protestant theology, without doubt, nobody disagrees with this, was John Calvin. Is there such a word? Yeah. Systematizer. Systematizer. A person who systematizes, makes it into a system. So, um, boy, this crowd is rowdy today, especially now that somebody came in. Late. Um, Calvin was born in France, now you own France, uh, July 10th of 1509. He, you know, to give you some perspective, he was born, by the time he was born, Luther was already on the faculty at, at Wittenberg University and was already offering lectures. So he is the next generation after um, Luther. He was a precocious boy. His father had actually been assistant to the bishop. And at 12 years old, Calvin ends up as the clerk to the bishop. He starts studying very early and becomes very early proficient in Latin and Greek and several other languages. He's, he's a brilliant guy. Um, his father had made arrangements for him to have two minor ecclesiastical posts, which, are, which provided him money while he was a student, which he 
when he finally decided that he didn't agree with the Catholic Church while still a young man, he renounced those positions uh, as a matter of integrity for him. Um, he, Calvin wanted to pursue an ecclesiastical career. He wanted to go into the church, um, but in the course of, in, but his father didn't want him to. His father wanted him to be a lawyer. Well, Calvin, when he went to university uh, to get a general degree, he did study philosophy and theology a great deal. Um, and he, again, as, as with Spingley, this was a time when there was a strong humanistic focus to the academic pursuits in Europe, which meant focus on human achievement, on intellectual pursuits, on the arts, the things that humans do. Calvin, uh, a little more so than Spingley, kind of rebelled against some of that. Some of his professors were, were uh, kind of elitists, or what he called elegant humanists, whose whole focus seemed to be humanity and humanity's potential. And very early on, he's, Calvin kind of rebelled against some of that, even though he was very scholarly and very much an academic. Um, he became very early on in his university days familiar with the doctrines of Wycliffe, of Huss, and of Luther. Uh, as those things, Wycliffe and Huss, their, their writings were readily available well before that, and then as Luther is developing his ideas, uh, those things are available, and so Calvin grows up in that kind of milieu, reading this kind of stuff. And yet, having read those things, Calvin's own words early on in his life was that uh, I was stubbornly tied to the superstitions of the papacy. It took him a long time to break away from his commitment to the Catholic Church. He'd been the clerk of a bishop. His father had worked for the bishop. In 1528, he, re he received a Master of Arts degree. <coughs> and his, um, his father, at that point, forced him into legal training. And so he, became a he went into law school. He actually finished law school and got his legal degree, but um, while he was still focusing on the law, his father passed away. His father was very controlling, as was usual back then. The fathers decided what the sons were going to do. When his father died, Luther, uh, Calvin pulled back from his law practice. He went to Paris. He finished his studies in theology and um, eventually went on to support the Protestant cause. During this time, he had what he describes as a religious experience. He doesn't give us a whole lot of detail about that. It's very funny. Um, he, uh, okay, he, uh, I just realized I got something wrong in here. Calvin was very unlike Luther. We have a vivid sense of the whole process Luther went through to come to his beliefs because he kept journals, he wrote on this, his anguish. Um, Calvin was much more reserved you know, he was more of a lawyer. He was much more reserved. He didn't write a lot about his personal feelings. All that we know is that he went through a religious experience sometime around 1532. He mentions it twice, uh, but not in a whole lot of detail. That was also when he published his first book. So he, um, he once he had a religious experience, he began to think again about the readings that he had read of Luther and Wycliffe, Huss, others and decides that he agrees with them. And he is concerned about studying scripture and seeing if Luther and the others are right about the need for the church to become more what the New Testament says it is, it should be, rather than what the papacy says that it should be. Um, it was around that time, not shortly after he became a Protestant, decided to become a Protestant and renounced his ecclesiastical positions, um, that he Francis I of, of France, these names keep popping up, same period, you know, a little, little bit later, but same general period of time, Francis I had been fairly tolerant toward Protestants up at that point. Again, Luther is, is uh, Luther. Calvin is French, he's in France. Francis, the king of Fran uh, France, decides that he's not going to be tolerant toward Protestants anymore, and so he starts a persecution. In 1535, Calvin leaves France and goes into exile in Switzerland in the Protestant city of Basel. Again, in Switzerland, there were not only the cantons that were independent, but there were like city-states. The major cities, Zurich, Basel, others, were pretty much city-states. They were run by councils and quite independent. Basel had declared itself a Protestant city. So uh, Calvin goes there. He spends his time there in study and in writing, and he decides that his calling, rather than to be a, a priest or pastor, which is what he had at first thought, that his calling was to be an academic to study and to write. He, at that point, starts writing his most important project, um, which was to be a short summary of the Christian faith from a Protestant point of view. He called that 
that were the institutes of the Christian religion. A short thing? A short summary. Well, it was a short summary first. When he first published it, uh, which is in 1536, which is the first edition, he, um, it, it was printed in very small format because in those days they had big pockets and he wanted a book that they could actually fit in their pockets. Now it was quite a few pages, but it was only four chapters. And so it was not a major work in the first edition in 1536. But um, in those four chapters, address the law, the creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the sacraments. And then two polemical issues related to that time, and that were the Protestant positions regarding what he believed the false sacraments of the Catholic Church were. Well, when he published it, it was a huge success immediately. I mean, it sold out, uh, the, the first printing of it sold out in nine months. Uh, his name spread across Europe. The Protestants were all saying, who is this guy, and why, why did he take so long to write this? And because of that encouragement, Calvin continued to work on the Institutes of the Christian Religion his whole life. The last edition of it was published shortly before his death. And it went from being four chapters that you could carry in your pocket to being four volumes with 80 chapters. It is the most... The, the two major theologies of the Christian faith, I believe written theologies, are uh, Thomas Aquinas on the Catholic side and the Institutes of the Christian Religion uh, by Calvin on the Protestant side. Luther celebrated the publication of the Institutes. He thought Calvin was exactly what the, the Protestants needed at that point. So, uh, hugely popular. Everybody was, was talking about this guy. Um, at that point, Calvin decided, this is what I should be doing. I should be studying, I should be writing, I don't need to be a pastor or a priest. And so he decided that he needed some place to do that. He decided the place for that was going to be another uh, Protestant city where Protestants were not uh, persecuted, and that was the city of Strasbourg, where Martin Bucer, B-U-C-E-R, was the, uh, the sort of religious leader of the Protestant movement. He's headed there in 1939, um, I'm sorry, in the... Uh, the 1930... 15. 15. Yeah, 15, 15, 19. I was looking at something else when somebody was named uh, a saint. Um, he decides in 1536 to move to Strasbourg, but there's military uh, <coughs> things going on, and so he can't go straight to Strasbourg. He has to think a roundabout route, so he goes through Geneva. He stops in Geneva, intending to be there for one night, but when he arrives in Geneva, word spreads that the guy who wrote the Institutes is in town. Well, in, uh, in Geneva, at that point, the, uh, the people of Strasbourg had sent missionaries to try to help the Protestant movement in Geneva. One of those missionaries was a man named William Farrell. He was the head of the missionaries that had come to help, and they were completely overwhelmed. They were being asked to launch the Protestant Reformation in this city and lead the church and help the city government and everything else, and Farrell is pulling out his hair. Well, he hears that this theologian, John Calvin, Jean Calvin, as his name is in, in French, is in town, for heaven's sake. So Farrell goes to see him and says, you've got to stay here and help us, here in Geneva. And Calvin says, absolutely not. I, I don't want to be a pastor. I'm not a leader. I don't want to be involved in all the stuff that you're doing. I'm going to go to Strasbourg, study and write. Well, Farrell says to him, May God condemn your repose and the calm you seek for study if before such a great need you withdraw and refuse your succor and help. Oops. Wow. Calvin reports, uh, writing about this later, Calvin says, those words shocked and broke me and I desisted from the journey I had begun. He stays in Geneva and starts working with Farrell and the other missionaries. Now, um, very shortly, they realized that his legal training, his theological insight, his reforming zeal, his intelligence, and his leadership, which he didn't think he had, are so, are so significant that he very quickly becomes the religious leader in the city of Geneva as they're beginning to create this new uh, Protestant city. Not everybody liked it. As he started gaining popularity, um, the city council there in Geneva decided they needed to control these guys a little bit, and so they started trying to limit their authority. Well, Calvin said, you're either going to do this or you're not, and you better straighten up. And so they insisted on authority to do whatever they felt was necessary to pursue the Reformation as it was needed. Um, after a period of time, the government of the city 
shut them down. They refused to allow them to do some of the things they wanted to do. Ultimately, the major issue was Calvin felt like they needed the authority to excommunicate people who were heretics or who were not following, you know, who were not along with the plan. And the city government said, no, you can't excommunicate them. That should be the city government. The, the, the civil authorities decide who gets excommunicated. And that sounds so foreign to us, that the civil authorities were arguing that they had the right to make religious decisions. But back in those days, there was not the kind of division we're used to. Well, they said, and if you're going to demand that, Calvin, you have to leave. And so Calvin leaves. And they told Farrell he could stick around, but Farrell said, no, if he has to go, I'm going. So the two of them leave. Uh, the, at that point, Calvin decides he's going to go on to Strasbourg, do what he meant to do originally, and he went to Strasbourg. He shows up in Strasbourg, uh, thinks things are going to be wonderful there, and that's where he had, he had communicated before, but where he meets Martin Busser. Martin Busser, who was older, ends up being his mentor, his guide. He helped him formulate some of the specifics of his theology, but when Calvin shows up there thinking he's just going to study and write, Busser says, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> We have a group of French Protestant refugees who had been forced to flee, as Calvin had, flee France because of persecution, and they need a pastor. Guess what, Jean? You're going to be the pastor. So even though he didn't want to do it, he agreed that he was going to become the pastor. In fact, the next three years were considered probably the most peaceful and happiest of his life the time he spent in Strasbourg as pastor. While he was there, he developed French translations of a number of psalms, a number of hymns. He developed a French liturgy, uh, various other church tools to, to assist them. And during that period of time, he also got married. He married uh, Idolette Boer, who, very similar to, to Zwingli, who wrote so passionately and lovingly about his wife after her death. Same thing with Calvin. Uh, he... he loved his wife dearly and considered her a gift from God, even though he struggled for a long time and all of his friends and colleagues were telling him he ought to get married. He didn't think he should. He finally agreed, and it was a wonderful blessing to him. Well, he's there in Strasbourg for three years. He really enjoys it, but then the city of Geneva, the city government had changed in three years. They come back to him and say, you know, the, the previous council was wrong. We really need you. Would you come back? And he immediately says yes, because he sees the potential for that to be a place where they get it right in terms of the Protestant Reformation. So he returns to Geneva, to Geneva in 1541, and he immediately starts developing for Geneva a series of ecclesiastical uh, directives in terms of uh, the direction they ought to go. He creates, for instance, the model of church government, which currently exists in all Reformed and Presbyterian, I'll talk about that in a minute, churches, and that was that there was a consistory or session, as we call it today. The consistory would be made up of a combination of ordained pastors and of lay elders, and those, um, in addition to the pastors, you would have elders, you would then have teachers or doctors, which is a position that the churches always had doctors of theology, and then you would have deacons who would provide service. That basic model is what still exists today in churches that follow Calvin's theology. Um, <coughs> Even though at that point there were more elders designed in the system than there were pastors, uh, and it was a voting uh, consistory, uh, Calvin's, the respect they had for him and his influence was such that they very seldom didn't give him his way. He usually won the way, he, uh, the day, he usually got to do what he felt was necessary. Now, the um, consistory, that is the session of the church in the city of, Zur of Geneva, and the city government did often feud. They would fight about things, but they would work it out. Um, in 1553 was a time in which Calvin was really feeling especially challenged. And that was the year that something kind of strange and a little unfortunate happened. There was a man named Michael Servetus. Michael Servetus was a Spanish doctor, a physician, who actually had made a number of very significant discoveries about physiology and medicine, had been well known for that. But in addition to being a medical doctor, he also had written several theological treatises. Amongst those treatises, he had declared that, that Constantine and the early church, when they, when they sort of joined together the church and the state, that that was um, a horrible apostasy. And Servetus had written that the Council of Nicaea had been wrong and had committed apostasy when they declared what they believed about the Trinity. He didn't agree with the doctrine of the Trinity, which is a standard doctrine of the church.
Well, he, that is Michael Servetus, had been arrested in France, was under, uh, in prison, under the Inquisition, and had already been declared a heretic and was going to be burned at the stake. When he escaped, he escaped the prisons in, in France, he is passing through Geneva when he's recognized, reported, and arrested. The council, the city council, tells Calvin, as the head of the church there, you need to figure out what the charges are against him. And so Calvin identifies 38 different accusations of heresy against Michael Servetus, which were true according to the doctrines of the day. The Catholics and the Protestants felt like Servetus was a heretic. Well, those 38 uh, accusations caused the city council to put him on trial. He is found guilty of heresy, and he's burned at the stake. Now, Calvin... Um, while he believed that Servetus was a heretic, everybody did, Catholics, Protestants, everybody. In fact, before Calvin would proceed, he actually polled the other Protestant cantons in Switzerland and said, what do you think we should do with it? And they all said, he's a heretic and he needs to be executed. Understand, those were the days in which Catholics and Protestants alike, if somebody was blatantly guilty of heresy, they were executed. That's what they did. You can't really blame Calvin for that. Calvin actually advocated for a kinder punishment, and that is that he advocated that, that Servetus be beheaded, which is quick death, instead of being burned alive. Sure. Okay, I go for that. <laughs> unless there's a pretty quick. Unless there's a third door, you know. <laughs> that, um, that's why he's criticized today. Yeah, well, that's one in fact one of the criticisms, and some people think that that's exemplary or that's an example of the, of the way in which Calvin was so rigid, you know. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, he was very disciplined, but he wasn't that rigid. In fact, Calvin, like Stanley, really did a lot to try to advocate care of the needy and a lot of other things. Okay, but he he was insistent that there was a right and wrong, and they were in a position to have to fight against a lot of forces uh, that had existed that were wrong. Now, for all of that, that created a big problem, but the fact is that once Servius is found guilty and executed, Calvin's authority sort of shot up. They all acknowledged the fact that, okay, he really is in charge of the church here. Now, he continued to lead the Reformation in Geneva. He continued to publish the Institutes of the Christian Religion, as well as sermons and everything else. During his lifetime, uh, Calvin uh, preached over 2,000 sermons during his time in Geneva. Now, 2,000 sermons meant he, he preached twice on Sunday, at least three times during the week, all different sermons. In fact, he did that for a while, and it was such a burden, you know, it was really killing him, that finally the council said, okay, you don't have to do that. You can preach uh, once on Sunday and every once in a while. Well, after a very short order, they decided that's not working, so he had to preach twice on Sunday. He could skip a week, and then he preached five days the next week. So he oh. preached every weekday, every other week, plus twice on Sunday. In addition to writing, um, you know, translating hymns, writing uh, liturgy, writing commentaries on Romans and, and the Psalms, um, writing the Institutes of the, of the Christian Religion, which again he continued to work on throughout his whole life, he was a busy guy. He was also the primary person responsible for the government. There was a city council, but after he really was recognized as being the authority in the church, he was acknowledged as really being the authority of the city government as well. And so he was a busy guy. Um, the, during that period of time, one of the goals that he had throughout all of this was to create a school where the, where the, the Calvinist beliefs, and he would have called that, uh, but the beliefs that he had been working on and developing could be taught. In 1559, they created what was called the Geneva Academy, or the College of Geneva in some cases, <coughs> which was sort of like a grade great school and high school. Um, it was so popular that people were sending their students, their, their kids, from all over Europe. At one point, it had 1,500 students. And these young people were taught not only the, you know, the, the liberal arts education kind of thing, but also were taught religious education along the lines of the Calvinist doctrine. And so when those kids graduated and they went back to their homes all over Europe, they carried those ideas with them, which is one of the reasons, one of several reasons, why the Calvinist ideas ended up spreading around Europe. Um, and in addition to the children, there were a lot of other religious leaders who ended up coming, people like John Knox, who led the Protestant Reformation in Scotland came and spent several years in Geneva studying with, working with John Calvin. And that's why the Presbyterian Church of Scotland, which is the, you know, it's the Church of Scotland, which became the mother church of all Presbyterian churches, 
is Calvinist because it was it was created or is launched by John Knox, who studied with John Calvin. Uh, there were also Dutch uh, scholars, Protestants, who came and studied with Calvin and went back to the Netherlands, which is why you have the Dutch Reformed Church. Calvinist theology is uh, it was not called Calvinist during Calvin's life. He would have, he would have not accepted that at all. It was called Reformed theology, as in Reformation. To, dis, to distinguish it from Lutheran theology. So the two theologies that developed during that time were in the Protestants were Lutheran theology and Calvinist theology. There were some other beliefs, as, or I'm sorry, Reformed theology. And so Reformed specifically went back to the Netherlands and Low Countries, to, to uh, Scotland, and to a number of other places, but really influenced widely the whole Christian doctrine. Um, <coughs> Let's talk about Calvinism. Oh, and then Calvin, um, the final edition of the Institutes was published in 1560. There were some other sort of commentary versions of it after his death, but that's considered the, the final and the ultimate edition of the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Again, at that point, it was four volumes, 80 chapters. So it had grown 20-fold over what it had been originally. And then he dies in 1564 of natural causes, but probably exhaustion. Okay. Uh, literally, because he, um, you know, he wasn't he a, a, like a physically frail guy. Oh yeah, he was a little skinny guy. You know, not not well at all, particularly. Right. And that's one of the reasons why he always thought I'm, a, you know, I'm a scholar and a writer. I'm not a leader, because he didn't see himself that way. But he ended up being one of the most significant figures in the Protestant Reformation, theologically the most significant. Uh, but again, he, um, Luther, and Zwingli are, are called the three men of the Reformation. Now, let's talk about Calvinism. The main issue dividing Protestants um, in those times was the presence of Christ in the communion. It was not predestination. Most people think about Calvinism today, and they think the big issue is predestination. No. Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and those guys all agreed on predestination. They all believed that Scripture taught that God predestined some people to salvation and others to damnation. They all agreed on that. They didn't have a problem with that. And in fact, Calvin's doctrine of predestination was not the harsh thing that most people think of. Carolyn said there were five points. The five points of hyper-Calvinism, which are spelled out by TULIP, total depravity, unlimited you know, atonement, all of that, um, that came after Calvin. And it became a matter of really kind of aggressive, negative, you know, puritanical oppression, this, this idea of predestination, to the point that there was a time in Scotland where the Calvinists would literally fence the table. That's the expression, meaning strong men of the congregation would stand in front of the table, and if there was anybody who tried to come forward to take <laughs> communion that they didn't think was worth it, <coughs> or that was not worth it, they would forcibly prevent them. Okay? Or somebody who they decided was not predestined to salvation was not allowed. That was not Calvin. That was people who came long, at, quite a bit after Calvin was dead, who interpreted his doctrine so severely as to gain this negative reputation. And people think it was Calvin that said all that stuff. He didn't. In fact, Calvin, in his own writing, said, don't get hung up on predestination. That, yes, Scripture teaches predestination, but it is not for anybody to say whether someone else is predestined. And if you profess faith in Christ and you believe that He was risen from the dead, then you are predestined. Move on. Okay. It was later people who made it such a big issue. But the big issue was that the differences between the early reformers was this issue of the presence of Christ in, in the elements of communion. Again, Luther maintained something very close to transubstantiation, even though he renounced that particularly. He had what he called consubstantiation, that the presence of Christ was literally there and descended upon the elements. Then on the opposite end, you had some mainly who said they were just symbolic. And you find churches today that represent these different positions. Calvin comes along, along with Martin Bucer, and says that, that the presence of Christ has not descended in a literal way, either in transubstantiation or consubstantiation, but that spiritually it has happened. The presence of Christ has spiritually descended so that it conveys the significance of being the real body and blood of Christ for those who partake in faith. So it was kind of a middle road between Lutheranism and Zwinglianism. Um, after the time of Luther and, and Swingley and even Calvin, there was much more unity uh, between them. In fact, various of them got together um, in, like, Bucer, who agreed with Calvin about, about the nature of communion, 
and Luther agreed on the Wittenberg, the Wittenberg Concord, which was a theological agreement. Later on, there was a thing called the Zurich Consensus, where various other Calvinists got together and, and um, agreed on what their beliefs were. After Luther died, there were Lutherans who went after Calvin in, in a big way. Philip Melanchthon, the primary Lutheran after Luther's death, refused to. And in fact, he pretty much concurred with almost everything Calvin said and refused to attack Calvin, even though a lot of other Lutherans did. It was at that point that they started talking about Calvin's theology as being the Reformed theology so that it had a name that wasn't a person's name that differentiated it from Lutheranism because there was more than just Calvin involved in, in Zwingli and others were involved in that. But those became the very significant early theological uh, presences of the Reformation. Okay? I could talk a lot more about Calvin because he's one of my heroes, but I, I'm not going to right now because I've got two other things I want to talk about. Any questions about, about any of that? His, uh, his, his commentary came out of, the, of what he preached there in, in Geneva, didn't it? Well, I'm sure that they were related to each other, but he wrote some commentaries that were just commentaries. They weren't just, he didn't like just convert sermons. His commentary on Romans was, you know, was specific to uh, his study of Romans. So, yes? Could you please repeat again why the belief in predestination is there? Because scripture says so. I mean, um, I guess I'm asking, yeah. what is that scripture? I, I, I can't get into that right now. I, I can do it later. There are places where it says, you know, God has called, has, has preordained. Read, you know, read the first chapter, uh, the first two chapters of Ephesians, read Romans 8. Um, even in the book of Acts that we looked at in class yesterday, you know, talk, Peter in the great sermon said, all those whom God has called. Oh, that's what he meant by that. Exactly. You know, that God calls people that he is predestined. Okay. And again, there are other places where it says, I mean, if you, if you take that too far, as some people have, that means you never preach. Okay? You never, well, why preach? Because God's going to call, he's going to call, and everybody else is not going to come anyway, so why bother? There are other places where it says, all who, you know, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so you've got those two pieces of it. And those things, in my mind, in my theology, have to be held in dynamic tension. I believe it when Scripture says, and it says it often, that God has preordained some, and they use the word preordained or predestined, some to salvation and some to damnation. And I don't claim to understand the morality of God in that or, or how that works, but He is God and I am not. And yet I also, and so I believe that theologically, but I also believe it that I have a responsibility to preach the gospel that as many as would hear and would call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now those may only be the people, the people who call on the Lord may only be the ones he's predestined. That doesn't relieve me of responsibility for preaching the gospel. Okay? And there is that tension. And the, the only proper response to me is one of humility. Yeah. Just saying, I don't know Great everything. Great okay? Yeah, and in fact... For Luther, and for Calvin, and for Swingley, and for so many others, it was a declaration. The fact that God calls any at all yes. is an act of grace and mercy, because none of us deserve it. Okay. Yes. And so rather than condemn the idea that there's something God doesn't call, how can we not be in awe of the fact that he gives anybody grace? Amen. Because we don't deserve it. Yes. Yes. You mentioned that the... Uh his first book was only uh, very short, four chapters. Mm -hmm. We were summary on law, creed, sacrament. What was the fourth? Uh, the law, the creed, the sacrament. Um, well, included in there, and it may have been the fourth section or not. I'd have to look back up okay. again in my notes. Uh, was uh, a polemic against the sacraments of the Catholic Church. Okay, in other words, part of it was here's what we believe, and then there was one section that said, and here's why we don't believe what they believe. Okay. Um, I can look that up again for you if you no want. Problem. Okay, so check with me afterwards. All right? I want to talk about the Anabaptists very quickly. Um, <coughs> in Zurich, during the time of Ulrich Stingley, by the way, sometimes you'll see Stingley's first name uh, spelled Huldrich with an H. Ulrich, Huldrich, um, same thing. The, in Zurich, there were a group of people under Zwingli, uh, meaning they were Christians as part of the body, who believed that Zwingli had not gone far enough. Even though he'd gone much further than any other reformers in terms of the things he allowed in the church, they felt like there had to be a significant change, especially to differentiate the church of Jesus Christ from everybody else in society, to separate the church from the state, if you will. 
Um, and that there was a big problem going back to the, uh, the time when Constantine was converted to Christianity, or at least began to support it, and the church and the state sort of joined with each other, okay? Um, there was a strong sense by some of these people in Zurich at that time that the church, um, it was only to be made up of those who had made a personal decision to become part of the church, which means they denied infant baptism. Infant baptism, which says that infants can be part of the church in terms of being raised up in the church until they reach the age they can make their own profession of faith. But they are, you know, they're to be raised in the church, which means they need to be part of the church, and so they're baptized as infants. They still are responsible to make their own profession of faith for salvation later on. But there were some people who felt that was not valid, that you had to be an adult, make a profession of faith, and that the community of faith then had a responsibility to live in a radically disciplined way. The early Anabaptists, as they came to be called, the ones who thought Zwingli hadn't gone far enough, they said that we needed to take the Sermon on the Mount absolutely literally and live by it, and if you say it's too hard, you can't live by it, it's only because you don't have enough faith. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount. Go home tonight and read Matthew 5. It's tough stuff, and the, the traditional interpretation is that Jesus is calling his followers to a, the highest possible level of uh, discipline and of almost perfection in order for us to be so much better than we are without the expectation we're really going to be there. Just like when he said, be perfect even as your Father in Heaven is perfect. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to get that perfect. Not in this life. And yet, Jesus says that to me because he wants me to do everything I can to get there. Well, traditionally, the Sermon on the Mount was interpreted just the same way. And yet, the Zwinglian, and uh, the, the Zurich, um, Reformers who thought Zwingli hadn't gone far enough, they insisted that no, we absolutely have to do all of that. And you take that stuff literally, it means when it says, when someone strikes you on you know, one cheek, turn to him the other. That means no um, military response, no violence, absolute pacifism. Okay, so they took the statements of the New Testament absolutely literally and said, we have to live like that. Now, that's one of the things that created such a problem with the Anabaptists, because the early ones uh, were radically pacifists. You need to realize that these are adults in a society where half of Europe was afraid that the Turkish armies were going to invade any day, and somebody who said they were pacifists and they wouldn't even fight back against the Turks was seriously suspicious. They were thought to be treasonous, even. That was disloyalty. You were against your country if you wouldn't defend it from the Turks. Likewise, the Protestant cantons in, in Switzerland said, you know, the Catholic cantons could march in here any day and kill us all. And you're saying you're going to stand there and let your wife and children and everybody just be killed and you won't lift a hand? There's something wrong with you. Okay. So both Catholics and Protestants looked at this idea and said, not just did they question it theologically, but they considered it treasonous. You know, you are, you, you are against your own country if you're not willing to ever defend it under any circumstance. So that was one of the reasons that they, they had difficulty. Well, a group of men challenged Ulrich Stingley in Zurich to become more radical in his beliefs. They called themselves the Brethren, or the Congregation of the True Believers. Well, these Brethren decided, that when, when Zwingli was not going to go as far as they thought he should, they decided they had to do something on their own, and that they were going to create their own congregation. A man named George Blaurock, who was a former, former priest, asked another of the members, uh, Conrad Brebel, to baptize him. Now he's a priest. He'd been baptized, he had been a Catholic priest. He'd been baptized as an infant. But he asked another member who was a layperson to baptize him as an adult. So in 1525, January 21st of 1525, Conrad Brebel baptized this man, uh, George Blaurock, who was a former priest, in the city square fountain in Zurich. Rebel then turned around and baptized a number of other believers, and they formed a congregation, the Congregation of the Brethren at that point. Now, because they baptized each other, and they had all been baptized before, as they formed this congregation, they developed the name, or the name began to be applied to them, which was considered derogatory at first, which was Anabaptist, which means to re-baptize, because they'd all been baptized as infants. Now, they would declare that we aren't rebaptizing because we don't think infant baptism is real baptism. They would have said this is the first baptism, and if somebody wasn't baptized as an infant, which unlikely that would have happened back then, but then they're getting baptized for the first time by us. 
The issue is adult baptism on profession of faith. That was their whole focus. Okay? Now, this, anti, this Anabaptist movement, as I say, was opposed by Catholics. It was opposed by Protestants. They were persecuted more because they were considered subversive politically than because they were considered theologically heretical. Um, Luther and Zwingli both had advocated, and this is before Calvin comes along, so Luther and Zwingli had both said the church and the state, while they may have different you know, focus and should have different focus, they can exist side by side, and they have certain responsibilities to each other. And among those is that as adult citizens of a country, the member of a church is responsible to be obedient to the laws of the state. And the state, on the other hand, has a responsibility to protect the individuals that are members of the church. So they had responsibilities. That included responsibilities for service when called upon for the political civil entities. The Anabaptists come along and they reject all of that, and in doing so, they threaten the established order as far as everybody else was concerned. And so they were persecuted. In fact, they were found uh, guilty of violating religious laws about baptism and things, and also civil laws because they wouldn't serve. It's like, they were like draft dodgers, okay? And so they were considered to be in violation both of, of church law and of civil law. And so both the church, church Protestant and Catholic, and the, um, the civil authorities all felt like they had a responsibility to suppress this. Yes? They also refused, did they not, to uh, serve politically, like as mayors or... Anything that would require taking of an oath. Yeah. And later on, they, they, and I'll, I'll talk in a second about that, they came up with the, the Schleitheim Confession, and the confession was a number of points of what they could and could not or should and should not do, and one of them was the taking of an oath. That meant you can't take an oath as a military soldier or anything else that would require you to swear an oath. Again, what are they doing? They are literally interpreting Jesus' of words when he says, you know, don't swear any oaths. Let your yes be yes and you know, your no be no. Anything more than that is a sin. They took that very literally. And so they would not swear an oath, and if, uh, uh, they would not take public offices because that required you be sworn in to take an oath. They wouldn't do it. So, um, the Council of Government in Sphingley, Zurich, uh, began to say that the Anabaptists were heretics and had to be persecuted. Um, the, because the persecution had started, in order to try to make their points clearer, the uh, Anabaptists got together and drafted the Schleitheim Confession. This was in Schleitheim, Switzerland, in 1527. The five points, there were seven fundamental, I'm sorry, the seven fundamental points were made. The first point is that baptism is only for adults who profess uh, their faith in Christ. Second, and that meant no infant baptism. Second, the, um, that Christians were responsible to be obedient to the ban, it was called, which meant if someone was found to be in sin, they would have um, two private and one public um, uh, remonstrances, meaning somebody would tell them they're wrong. If they did not respond to two private and one public remonstrance, then they were banned from communion, excommunicated. Okay? The third point was that communion was in both kinds, but not to be offered to those who were not baptized. We had that conversation today a little bit in our, you know, the idea that it goes all the way back to the start of the Reformation, and, you know, obviously the Catholic Church wouldn't offer, offer communion to those who weren't baptized. But they declared, point number three, that communion was only for baptized believers in Jesus. Fourth, that believers had to separate themselves from anything that was not a God, meaning they had to be uh, the separatist kind of approach to things. Fifth, that there were specific pastors of duties. And sixth and seventh other principles of the Schleitheim Confession rejected the use of the sword, the sword, meaning... All forms of violence or war, all giving of oath, uh, anything in which war, civil service, oaths to rulers or magistrates, anything like that. Well, they thought that was going to clarify things, and it made it much worse. Starting after that, um, the Council of Government in Zurich said that Anabaptists were be to be condemned to death. The Catholic areas of Switzerland declared they were condemned to death. Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor in 1528, ordered that they all be put to death. Um, the Diet of Spire in 1529, which was the Diet of Spire, was where Protestants were first called Protestants because they protested against the, the renouncing of previous declarations. They approved the imperial decree for death to all Anabaptists. The only prince in all of Germany, the only real ruler who refused to apply the edict against the Anabaptists, 
was Philip I, the Landgrave of Hesse, the same guy that tried to call, the, that, that did call the Marlboro uh, Colloquy together. Really good guy. He refused to oppress them. But Anabaptists were, um, were persecuted both for uh, heresy and for sedition against the government. And everybody was out to get them. There were more martyrs, as I said before, more Anabaptist martyrs during this period of time than all of the Christian martyrs between Jesus and Constantine, the first 300 years of the Roman persecutions. Okay? Um, it was pretty horrible. And yet, that's the way it went. Now, the first... Um, I can see right now I'm going to get to the English Reformation next week. <laughs> By the way, so you Anglophiles come back next week. The first leaders of this Anabaptist movement were scholars, and they were all complete pacifists. But the fact is that the persecution was so bad, almost all of them were killed. Almost all of the early leaders were, were murdered or were uh, killed. And interestingly enough, because they were rebaptizers, many of them were drowned. It was a, an ironical kind of approach. Many were burned at the stake, some were tortured to death, some were drawn and quartered. But the favorite thing to do with these rebaptizers was to drown them, because they thought that was a, a symbolic kind of thing to do to them. Um, well, after the first generation of Anabaptist leaders uh, were died out, the next generation were not as scholarly, and they became more radical. Um, you had some very strange, sort of apocalyptic, radical things going on. There was one Anabaptist leader in that second generation, and, and they, they associated, at that point, they began to associate with the peasant needs. Remember when we talked about Luther last week, we talked about there were a number of peasant rebellions because of the oppression, and Luther actually told the princes, you know, these peasants have, have a good point. They really are being oppressed. You should be nicer to them. But then when the peasants actually rose up in violence, Luther said, but they can't do that. You need to put them down. Well... These peasant rebellions, the Anabaptists sided with the peasants as well. And so again, there was reason for the civil government to think that they were, they were not only heretics, but they were seditious. They were causing political problems. The, after that first generation, a man named Thomas Munster came along who kind of epitomized that. He sided with the peasants in their revolt um, and caught, cried for social justice, was not a pacifist, cried for military up, uprising, because of that, he was arrested and executed in 1525. Then a guy named Melchior Hoffman, but he sort of epitomized that first kind of militant, non-passivist non group. A man named Melchior Hoffman um, came up, and he, Hoffman was a, a leather maker. He had started out as a Lutheran, and then he became a Zwinglian, and then he became an Anabaptist. Okay, I'm sure if he lived a while longer, he would have become a Calvinist. You know, it, 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 Baha'i, I don't know. Anyway, Hoffman, <laughs> Hoffman went to Strasbourg because Strasbourg was a city that was still allowing a measure of, of tolerance to the Anabaptists. And at Strasbourg, he began making these prophetic visionary statements. He declared that the day of the Lord was coming and that he was the one that was going to be declaring it. He really inflamed the multitudes. But what happened is, because Strasbourg was tolerant, that he declared this the city of the New Jerusalem. And so a lot of Anabaptists started coming there. Well, part of his prophecies is Hoffman said that the first thing that would happen is he would be imprisoned. And he would be imprisoned for six months, and at the end of six months, the end would come. And that would be the great day of the Lord. Well, they arrested him, put him in prison. And everybody went, well, there's one. <laughs> and so they all started gathering around Strasbourg. But then... So many Anabaptists were getting in Strasbourg, they decided that maybe it wasn't such a good idea to be so tolerant, because they were taken over the place. And so they started taking action, repressive measures against them, and at that time, um, the, some prophets arose in the city of Munster, which was nearby, and said, oh no, Hoffman was right, but it's not Strasbourg, it's going to happen over here, guys. So everybody goes to Munster. Munster had had a history of these sort of a prophetic, apocalyptic kind of things anyway. Anabaptists gather in Munster. They're not persecuted. They think that the end is going to come right away. Well, some of the leaders in Munster, while Hoffman is still in prison over in Strasbourg, uh, John um, Matthias, Matthias I assume it's pronounced as Dutch, and John of Leiden were the two leaders. John Matthias was the primary leader. The first thing they do when they get in Munster, and so many Anabaptists show up, they now have the biggest part of the population. They force the Catholics out of the city. Well, the, bi the Catholic bishop of Munster doesn't take that very kindly. He's forced away from his palace and his 
get his church and everything else. So he goes out, gathers up an army, and besieges the city. The bishop is besieging the city now, the Catholic bishop. Well, about that time, the um, Anabaptists also decide there's something wrong with the moderate Protestants, and they force them to leave the city. There in this city, the bishop is, is besieging them. They start destroying sculptures and paintings, anything that has to do with the traditional worship of the church. And the bishop, every Anabaptist that tries to sneak out, because food's getting short, every Anabaptist the bishop catches, he publicly executes. And it's getting worse and worse. Some of the Anabaptists are going out to fight skirmishes and battles, and a lot of the men are getting killed. Some of the men are sneaking off. Well, they get to the point, uh, John uh, Mathis, I guess his name would be, goes out in the skirmish and he's killed. That left John of Leighton in charge. Well, John of Leighton, in the city, a lot of the men have been killed or gone. There are many more women than men. He declares that polygamy is now the rule of the day because there are too many women, and he says the ancient patriarchs, you have polygamy. We now have polygamy. He then goes out and they have a skirmish and he actually wins a battle, which they had won many, and they declare him the new, the king of New Jerusalem. And things get weirder and weirder and weirder until finally one night some of the people who didn't support all of this open the gates and let the bishop and his army in. The bishop uh, captures John of Leiden. He takes him and his two principal lieutenants, parades them around, publicly tortures and executes them, hangs their bodies up in these cages so everybody can see them. In fact, until fairly recently, apparently, if you went to Munster, they still had the cages where John of Leiden and his two lieutenants had been you know, publicly displayed after they were tortured and killed. And this whole thing comes to an end, but it leaves a pretty bad taste in everybody's mouth about what Anabaptism is all about. About that time, right about the time that John of Leiden is doing all the stupid stuff in, in Munster, a man named Menno Simons, who is a Dutch Catholic priest, um, I'm going to go back and Menno Simons. Oh, come on. Okay, this was a picture taken not long before his death. <laughs> Joke. Come on. <laughs> Menno Simons is a Dutch Catholic priest, and because of the martyrdom of some Anabaptist had struck him so hard, Menno Simons started prayerfully studying this and looking at issues like infant baptism, which again was one of the major issues that they, in addition to pacifism, that the Anabaptists held, and he decides that the Anabaptists are right. So he leaves the Catholic priesthood, he joins an Anabaptist group in 1536, which is the same year that John uh, Light and his cohorts were executed. And he very soon becomes the leader of this particular group of Dutch Anabaptists. In fact, he becomes so significant a leader, they begin to call themselves Mennonites. Well now, the Mennonites suffered a lot of the same persecutions of the Anabaptists, but they were not nearly as radical, they kept their head down. And Menno Simons traveled extensively. He wrote many treatises in support of his followers, he visited many, many of the locations. He moved pretty much constantly. And he maintained, he believed, as a lot of others do at this point, the thing that had led to the really bad turn they made at Munster in the Anabaptist movement was that they, they moved away from pacifism. And so they absolutely maintained pacifism after that. Um, but they also insisted that they should obey civil authorities. As long as the civil authorities didn't tell them to do something contrary to scripture, they had a responsibility to be good citizens. Other than that, they follow most of the other doctrines that the, uh, the Anabaptist movement had. They were still considered subversive by some governments, and it ended up that, they, that the Mennonites began to focus in Russia and in North America. A lot of them migrated, either east or west, Russia and North America, because they had more freedom. Well, after a while, they started being persecuted in both of those places. And so, in the 19th and 20th century, there was a huge migration of Mennonites to South America, where um, they were given much more freedom. There's a lot more space. And I've wondered, I don't know the answer to this, but you know, the Mennonite, the Mexican Mennonite cheese? Yeah, it's okay. Chihuahua. Um, the, there's a, a large Mennonite community in Chihuahua that makes cheese. I've wondered if maybe that was a result of part of that migration south. Actually, um, these those Mennonites came from Canada. They were Canadian Mennonites. Just who, further south. Yeah. Who, no. <laughs> who um, had some... It's in North America. So the problem yeah, is North Canada America. is North yeah. America. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I said it was a question. It, there was a schism in, in, in the group, as, okay. as, as there always are. Yeah, they're heading back to Canada, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they are. <laughs> back to the old country. <laughs>
Yeah. Um, so, Mennonites, the Mennonites became really the only significant branch of the Anabaptists. You think, okay, Anabaptists became the Baptists. Actually not. Baptists came out of the Calvinists. Um, and maybe what I will do, and this is probably the right time to do it next week, is I will bring a chart which will give you an idea of what all the different streams of Christianity, especially Protestant Christianity, ended up being. At a certain point, it will give you a headache, I promise you, when you see all the different you know, breakings off that happened. But the Mennonites became the largest and really the only significant uh, body of Anabaptists. But they were very important. Uh, some of the things, for instance, when they advocated, um, they advocated almost complete equality. Women were considered just as important as men in their fellowships. It was not, it was not male dominated. They believed, and in most cases manifested this, that the poor and the ignorant, meaning the uneducated, were just as important and just as valuable as the rich and the learned, which was unheard of. I mean, there was every other religious body had very clear class distinctions. You know, if you were if you were higher born, to the manner born, as they would say, or if you were highly educated, then you're considered more important to society. And if somebody had to be sacrificed, guess who was going to be, guys? The Mennonites did not believe any of that. Uh, in fact, all of the Anabaptists did, except the crazy ones, you know, the ones who were Strasbourg. Um, but so there was this equality, this sense of fairness, this sense of compassionate response to people, no matter what their circumstance. And in many ways, because of that, and because they didn't have, didn't believe in persecuting anybody, they really did symbolize a very modern idea toward equality and egalitarian under belief in the church and to um, tolerance. You know, we take tolerance for granted today, not knowing that it was just invented a couple of weeks ago, pretty much, in terms of the scope of history. And yet the Mennonites were the, were the first people who really established what we now take for granted as some of the standards of what, what fair-minded and true religious belief ought to be. Okay? Any questions about that? Yes, Judy? What's the difference between the Mennonite and the Hutterite? Uh, the Hutterite movement was, came out of that as well. Um, I think the Hutterite movement also was a brethren movement that came from the Anabaptists, uh, but was, was more German. See, the Mennonites started in, in the Netherlands and then moved. The Hutterites were German, if I remember correctly. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not an Anabaptist expert. Yes? I heard that, that the infant, infant baptism developed in Germany originally. Way back, way back when, when they wanted, they were afraid that witches and warlocks and satanists were going to grab babies that were okay. unbaptized. Is that true? Well, that would have been a pagan belief. That that I don't believe that would have been the thing that caused infant baptism to be part of the Christian. Um, I, there are, I mean, there are parallels that exist between pagan practices because there's only so many ways you can do things. But well, it was, it was supposed to be un the, the, the Satan's yes. raft or un unbaptized Christian babies to okay. sacrifice. So well, that, that's, what I, that's what I understand. It's possible. I would have to go back and look at that. I mean, I wasn't aware that, that Germany would have been the source of that. But, um, yeah, I, I think most people think the source of it in the New Testament, it says that whole families became Christians. Yeah. And that, that would have meant that if they became Christians, and in those days that meant they were baptized into the fellowship of believers, if it was all families, then there would have been children involved. So, I don't know. Yes? Well, I was raised as a Catholic, and the way I was told when I was growing up is that an unbaptized baby, if they died, couldn't get to heaven. Well, that would have been um, traditionally true. That baptism was a necessary um, requirement for salvation. In fact, it was a story I read about... Um, it was actually an English lord. I'm not remembering his name right now. It was visiting Russia. And they were baptizing infants in a frozen river. And they had just cut a hole in the ice. And while the priest was lowering the infants into this icy water, one of them slipped out of his hands and was washed away down underneath the ice. And the family was celebrating that the baby would have been taken straight into heaven. So the idea of the significance of baptism, I'm sure that that's just the converse of the idea that without baptism, an infant would not be, uh, you know, would not be saved. But yeah, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us. But you need to understand that these are historical realities. Anything else? Questions? Comments? Next week, if you're an Anglophile, we'll come back because I will start with the Reformation in England next week. All right. God bless you guys.